understand the text, what do we think, uh, is there a particular political version or vision of experience that's being made here? Yeah. I think we said last week that uh, Lawrence often accused of being misogynistic. Uh-huh. But I, I sort of think the way he, he uh, the way uh, the, <coughs> this, this, this mate, she talks about the uh, preparing the husband's death, it's really tragic the way she's been conditioned to deal with it. Like she's not even thinking about the death, she's thinking about where the body's going to go. And, you know, sort of, not, and I think it was on the last, the last time I've the most profound one, but all she can say is, like, she went about making tidy in the kitchen. Um, so, clearly, it's, it's, there's a sense of tragedy in the way that she doesn't deal with, she's not being allowed to deal with the death of her husband, just it's another thing that she has to okay. deal with. So, so we've got quite a complex notion of politics here. Last week we talked effectively about sexual politics and about the representation of women within Lawrence's text and how, certainly within the critical reception of Lawrence, there was a lot of argument in the 60s and then 70s about whether he's a misogynistic writer, about whether he's sexist, about whether his representation of women is somehow cruel or, or biased. And certainly in this text, we, we've got a, a text that centres on the experience of women uh, centres on the domestic. It's quite unusual, I think, of writers of that period. How many writers could, male writers of that period, could write the experience of the domestic experience in that way, the, the, of the hearth, of the interior of the house? Men's work, think of Joseph Conrad, think of Ulysses, these are all people who are outside, these are people who are out doing things and being manly. What we've got with Lawrence is, is a really quite unique male perspective and male description of the experience of women. So it's political in two senses. One, in that he's bringing forth and demonstrating and talking about women's experience, but at the same time, there's a question of how he's doing that and the extent to which it's a sympathetic portrayal or whether it's a problematic portrayal. Yeah? Sort of argue both ways because you could say she's being callous the way she's all she can think about is when, when she goes to where she's going to fight before that she thinks she's in part of the natural fact there's been you know a tragedy that she's just trying to earn money to support her and the family or you could say that it's it's, it's a tragedy that she's in condition by society and what we're to think Absolutely. yeah I mean I think I'll, I'll repeat that for the people who won't be here at the back. But yes, you've got a situation where it's kind of, you look at her and she's thinking about the money and she's clearing up the, the flowers when they get in October and then she's tidying up the kitchen and she's worrying about... So there's a very pragmatic side to it. You can think, oh, oh she's a hard bitch, that one. She's not like, thinking about the money. But at the same time, you can think, yes, that's to do with the structure of the life that she has, the opportunities that are available to her. You can move one step further and say, there's a sense in which there is a displacement of emotion. That rather than come to face and to think about those emotions, at one stage what we do is we do things when a great kind of tragic or blow falls upon us is that you find yourself tidying your bedroom or something. Um, so there's also a sense in, in which there's a very similitude, a realism to the representation of that. And at the same time, there's actually a symbolic um, angle to this, and the way in which the the way that the flowers are knocked over and then are cleared up and put out is is part of a sort of expiation. That what one does is there's a certain ceremonial function to making sure that the flowers are back in a jar and that, that the the world is rewarded. So there's a kind of way in which that works at an unconscious symbolic level too. So so yeah, you can read it both ways, or indeed three ways, and, and that's again what one's doing when one's looking at a critical reading. It's like, well, what's the evidence here? of the representation of Elizabeth, say, and what does she do, and what are the potential interpretations of that? Because further, if we look at the style and the form, Lawrence isn't telling us what to think. Lawrence isn't giving us a, a heavy-handed kind of authorial intrusion, saying, well, at this point, she was only thinking about the money, what do you make of that? He's not saying that, he's saying she thinks about this, she thinks about that, and there isn't an authorial voice of judgment introduced. Now that seems to me there's something very significant about the text that you're saying. There's a kind of neutrality to the portrayal that seems a, a kind of almost an objectivity about even the representation of complex emotional states. Okay, there's a point uh, up here. I, I was going to say, like, um, it's interesting because the way that uh, he's kind of discussing reactions to death and to uh, someone close to you, because I think it's, it, uh, to a point it's unrealistic to, uh, it would be unrealistic to say that uh, someone close to you dies, it's 
uh, you know, normal reaction to mourn and cry and everything. Whereas um, she death hits people in different stages and also she can be, and I think she is in a way, disappointed and maybe ashamed at her own apparent lack of mm-hmm. feeling when he died. Sure, I'm going to... I think you're exactly right. What would a normal reaction look like? It's like, well, as soon as one starts to make the kind of judgments that we're starting to think about, it's starting to tell us something about ourselves and our own frames of reading. Okay, so you're faced with this text and you're bringing a lot of assumptions and a lot of kind of moral frameworks and presumptions to the experience of the character and to the representation. I think that's important to bear in mind. Let me take one more little bit about politics. Um, I'll come back to you soon. Well, I think that's that's a crucial, again, social documentary element to this, that, that Lawrence is, in reporting this situation in the mines, which is a familiar situation in the mines. And bear in mind, uh, I mean, if I give some more historical background here, there, there are big debates a few years earlier in the um, in the in Parliament, uh, where people like Lord George are saying um, they were trying to put together a tax, a tax on the super rich. Sounds familiar. Which would set up something like um, a, a pension scheme for people who get injured at work and for people who can't work anymore. And what Lord George was proposing was that we would tax the aristocrats and the really wealthy people to offer some kind of support for people who were unable to work anymore, who had been giving their working lives obviously to support uh, these very rich and super wealthy people. And uh, I think it's referred to by somebody as. as the, the, the suicide note of the Liberal Party, as I suppose Lord George had proposed this, and of course he's then immediately ushered out of power. So what Lawrence is writing from within is a position that's critical of the, the status quo, of the way in which the society is organised at that time. So yes, in order to understand the politics of the text, it is then important to look something of, of the historical background of some of the ways in which this is going to impact on this specific family at this specific time, absolutely. So I'm going to take one more political from Eastwood. I was going to say, just like expanding on that, because um, that, the, the, like, the historical background thing, you know that they had like the family societies and cooperative societies that um, like within the working class people used to look after each other. Um, I quite like how that was highlighted, like with the neighbours, mm-hmm. especially the reaction of um, the bloke that he works with. Um, I, I thought it was quite like it, it made it, it emphasised that community feel and that highlighted a, a void at the time between that sort of there's no no ceremony in death for the working class. It's not like a, they haven't got money to do that sort of thing with. They haven't got the the means to be able to like give him a big send off, and it's quite. Um, I don't know, normal. I liked it. I liked how it was normal like that. Okay, so there's, always, there's a certain familiarity to that normality. Mm-hmm. Well. This is, I, mean, I think it is a great document, as we said, of community. It's a, it's a document that shows how people in these kinds of communities work together almost without thinking about it. It's part of the instinct of community that, that grows up within a working class consciousness in that period of time. Okay, so that would be politics if we were looking at this text and we were trying to take trace particular political stories on the out of it. So looking at our basics, we could then use any of these elements of detail and out of it. Um, we're not going to particularly do that now, but if you're going to substantiate more of what we've been talking about, you don't have to go into the text and say, well, there's this moment when they bring the body in and the manager is talking about it and they're trying to come up with a story to explain uh, why he was left alone, for instance. And you could look at the words that are used specifically there. There's the word desertion, which actually only comes into a very late version. So that maybe hints at a relation to, to the war again. We mentioned that relation to the war and the way that people are disposable. One of the arguments that's made about the reason that so many people went off to war was that what was it to stay for? For most people, this experience of a kind of grinding poverty and limited expectation was normal. So to be marched off to war was actually something that was exciting, that was a potential liberation from this kind of life, which is why there was so little 
kind of the reaction initially against uh, construction or against signing up and going off the war? Because what was the value that one holds upon one's own life in an environment such as this? So you would start tracing, say, discussions about death or things that have implications for death and, and relating it to a vision of the text or to particular issues in the text. I've got one more question. <laughs> What's with what? Uh, we'll come back to that. Don't worry. That's the surprise. Okay, so there we are. We talked about the basics. So for those of you who are not reading uh, literature and reading English here in the, in the university, that's the way in which you've probably already thought about what it is to read a text, and this is to formalise or to theorise the way in which we read and come up with critical readings. So. If we have a quick look at the sort of reactions that happened to the text when it was first published, um, these are reactions on the whole to publication uh, in the Prussian Officer Collection in 1914. There is an earlier publication, which we'll talk about in a moment, on the chronology, but these are the ways that the critics reacted to the text when it was first published. And to a degree, what they're offering, although in rather different terms, um, are phrases that, that might resonate with our sort of reactions. A vivid, memorable, sincere and truthful passion and talked with painful life. And you can imagine uh, that, that that reproduces some of our kind of senses of the text. But some of this stuff about an ugly world, that seems to be, we're starting to get into um, a, value, a value judgment there. A hideous form of naturalism. Okay. We're getting into something that's really quite critical of drawing attention in this way and with this level of detail to the lives of these sorts of people. Okay, So there's kind of a criticism of the fact that these people have wandered onto the stage of literature. Um, there's criticism in the Athenaeum of the cruder, of the way that this represents the cruder and more instinctive side of humanity. In fact, again, as with often uh, negative criticisms of text, what the critic has taken a dislike to is something that may be unfamiliar, something that obviously they, they don't kind of have any sympathy with, but they are drawing attention to something that's significant about the text. Think back to T.S. Eliot last week and his criticisms of D.H. Lawrence. He was criticising Lawrence, but he was also putting his finger on where the difficulty, where the problem of Lawrence is, where the challenge of Lawrence is. So I think that phrase that, that Lawrence is looking at the cruder a more instinctive side of humanity is something that's very important. But yeah, that, there you've got people observing that there's a movement in his text to look into this kind of unconscious area, to represent <coughs> elements of our experience that haven't otherwise been expressed within a literary form. And then we get to, the world is not a fit place to live in. Lawrence is pitiless in his cruelty, relentless in his realism. It would be very interesting to think, how can you be relentless in your realism? Okay? It involves kind of being so detailed and precise and exposing so much of the kind of um, the painful reality, if you like. It almost becomes cruel to show those things. It's like, um, I understand, I didn't see it, there was, a, um, there was a, a showing of a caesarean birth on TV last night. Did anybody watch that? A live caesarean birth? Which I would say would be quite relentless in its realism, I thought. Um, that would be my concept of something that, that would I really want to see this? That might be where some of the limits of, of my expectations and, and so forth might be. For this particular reviewer in the Saturday Review, there we've got a situation where there's a relentless realism to this expression of, of working class families and life and experience. Okay. So that's how the initial... Whoops. How did I do that? <coughs> Come back. Okay. okay, so we can think about those um, critics, and again, this is a tip for how you go on about constructing your critical readings of text. Go to critics, see what they've said, and then offer your own critique and response to them. So you could be reading an essay about um, the, the odor of chrysanthemums, and then you'd find all this stuff about crudity and relentless readers and then you could respond to that and say, well, I can see what this critic is saying, but at the same time, for an audience today, or for a reader today, there's a different response to this kind of realism, or to the issue of ugliness or crudity or whatever it is. So you can start to distance yourself 
from the existing <coughs> critical perspectives. You can start to bring your own historical, moral, and political position to bear. Okay? So that would be if you're going a step further in your critical analysis and bringing to bear criticism of other critics. But I'm going to move on from that as well and start to problematize our sense of this text. And moving into an area that you'll see in a moment is an area called textual criticism. And the way I want to do that is to look very simply at the history of Odin Chrysanthemum. And this is where, to me, it gets to be fascinating and also a very different and suggestive way of reading. So here's a chronology. In 1909, I'll bang through this quite quickly, this is on the fourth slide that you've got, um, Lawrence starts scribbling a story that comes to be known as the Odin Chrysanthemum. We know this because there's a little fragment that exists in the Humanities Research Centre in the University of Texas. And that's the fragment that's at the back of, for those of you that have got it, this Cambridge edition. Has anybody got the Cambridge edition? Okay, the Cambridge edition of the Prussian officer has, um, that fragment is there as an appendix. So that's a very early version. But then he writes it up and he sends it off to the English Review. In fact, his then girlfriend almost certainly sent it off to the English Review. Eventually, he hears back from the English Review, um, from the editor of the English Review, who says, you're a genius and I want to publish your story. At least that's what he said later. Uh, but it actually took him over a year to publish the story, so I'm not quite sure how committed he was. But anyway, the editor says, we'll, we'll print this. So we then have what's called the first proofs, and we, these exist, and these are available in the library here at the University of Nottingham. They're a really good early version of the text, okay, the first proofs. And he starts correcting these early proofs, and so the version that we're going to look at in a moment is a manuscript, the proofs, with Lawrence scribbling all over it and changing those in readiness for publication. At the same time, He's writing lots of other things as well, and he starts writing a play treating exactly the same story. So I recommend that you go and have a look at The Widowing of Mrs. Holroyd, which is his play from the same time, which explores exactly the same story. And so you can look at the way he examines those same issues in performance and in a dramatic environment. I won't talk about that here, but it's certainly a comparison you might want to make. So he's thinking about these issues continually, <coughs> His other novel comes out, so things are starting to go well for him. And then, finally, he finishes his corrections on this first proofs document and um, sends it off to the publisher. He gets another set of proofs back. We think that there's some further corrections in May. And then in June 1911, uh, the story of Chrysanthemums is published all on its own in the English Review. Okay, and this exists. We've got this in the library, and this is called the periodical publication. Okay, so 1911 is the first appearance uh, publicly of this text. But already, we've got kind of the first proofs, which are an early version. We've got the corrections to those first proofs, which are really quite significant and substantial. Uh, and way back in the background, we've got the initial fragments. Okay, then life intrudes. Lawrence beats Frieda Weekly, the wife of <laughs> Professor Weekly of the University of Nottingham, as we talked about last week, and um, very soon they run off. Okay, so suddenly Lawrence is not only an author with a couple of books being published and a few stories, he's also this controversial figure um, who would be unwelcome on the University of Nottingham campus for the next 70 years. Okay, Songs and Lovers is published the following year. So, kind of He's not really thinking about Odor of Chrysanthemums at this time. He's gone off, he's written another book, he's become kind of famous as the author of Sons and Lovers, which is his first really successful novel. Okay? And that's been written kind of between 1911 and 1913. Huge success, huge celebrity. Um, he so he decides to go back to his, um, to his play, to the widow of Mrs. Holroyd. Then he gets into a bit of a hole. He's offered uh, a contract by a number of publishers and he wants to make as much money as he can from his new novels and from his new stories and he decides, okay, I'm going to collect the short stories that I've published elsewhere and put them together in a single volume, the volume that comes to us now as The Prussian Officer and Other Stories. That wasn't the title he wanted for it, but it came out as The Prussian Officer and Other Stories. But at that point, he was in Germany and um, he said, look, I haven't got any copies of my own stories. So he gets his friends to write to him and send him earlier copies of the story, which he then corrects and rewrites. He then gets, he sends those off to the publisher, and he gets another set of proofs, 
which he corrects, again, quite substantially. And so then in November of 1914, there is the publication of The Prussian Officer and Other Stories, which has a story called Odor of Chrysanthemums in it. And that story, substantially, is the story that's in your book there. Okay? So what we intended to do is use the later, or the final version of Odor of Chrysanthemums, the 1914 version, as opposed to the other major version, which is the 1911 version. Anyway, fortunately enough, uh, there was an enormous product of republishing all of Lawrence's um, work that's still going on. And in 1983, the Cambridge edition of the Prussian Officer and Other Stories comes out, which has yet another amended text, which gets rid of all kinds of little errors and, and production faults and uncertainties that have been there in earlier texts. And so that, in fact, is most often the basis for new versions and new publications of Odor for Something. Now, I can see most of you have pretty much switched off by now in thinking about the chronology of the emergence of this text. And, and I can understand that, um, because what, what's the point? What we've got in front of us is this story, Odor of Chrysanthemums, and we've talked about it, we know what it means, we were able to, to have an analysis of it. Why would the textual history be significant? Well, it's significant for two reasons, and that's what we're going to spend the remaining period of, of the class thinking about. It's significant, first of all, because we need to think about even the text that's in front of you as having emerged from a history, okay? And that piecing together a correct text is, for some people, a very important process. Because you wouldn't want a text that was full of errors and full of, of things that shouldn't be there. So we've got a sense of, of do we want to have as good a text as possible? Um, that's obviously much more pressing in areas where there are many different manuscripts of stories. If we go back to the Bible, for instance, which is where most textual theory emerges, it's okay, you've got, I don't know, however many different texts of, uh, of a particular story within the Bible, how do you know which one is going to be the best text or the authentic text? How do you bring them all together? How do you assess how to use that information? So that's one function of textual criticism. Within this particular case, it's quite curious because we, we know the chronology, we know when these different things uh, were written, so we can build a kind of story of the writing of this text. But clearly, in 1914, Lawrence made some more corrections and published, in a sense, his definitive 1914 version, so still, that may not convince you that it's an important thing for us to be doing. However, I think there's a further sense in which building the history of the text is significant and helpful. And this is the way in which one can compare the different historical moments of a text's genesis and evolution. So in 1911, Lawrence was in many ways a very different person from the person he was in 1909. He was certainly a very different person again by 1914. The elopement with, um, with Frieda Weekly, the writing of Sons and Lovers, and by the end of the writing of Sons and Lovers, he moved on to writing a new novel, which uh, eventually is The Rainbow, which is a radically different novel, again, from Sons and Lovers, which remains a kind of documentary um, realist fiction. The Rainbow is, is radically different in its conception, in its shape, in the way it talks about consciousness, in the story it tells, in its shockiness in some ways. So what we've got in the period from Sons and Lovers being published and him kind of starting to work the following year on bringing together his collection of short stories is Lawrence coming to what some people think of as his maturity as a writer. So when he's revisiting the order of chrysanthemums, he's revisiting it with a radically different perspective as an artist and a writer to the person who wrote the 1911 story. So if we compare the 1911 story to the 1914 version of the story, what we'll find there is evidence of what changes in Lawrence as much as what changes in the story. The, the evidence of those changes in the stories tells us things about how his art is altering and how his art is different. Furthermore, if we go back to those earlier versions, they tell us about the kind of story that he was writing in 1911, which, as we'll see, is a very different story from the story we have now. Okay, so that's the chronology, and now I think the last 20, 25 minutes is me trying to persuade you that textual criticism is interesting and is the way forward. 
Okay, so what is textual precision? <laughs> Two large chunks of quotation here, um, which I'm not particularly inclined to read to you. So within your pairs, I think it is significant because I need to have a catch my breath. I'd like you to read one to each other and then swap and let the other one read back the second quotation. Um, which are obviously pearls of, of fantastic wisdom. Uh, the first from Breton is just saying, look, textual criticism isn't simply about establishing the correct text. These days, that's not what it's about at all. It's about the way that we engage with the different versions of text, about the way in which we can bring into a single frame, a dynamic frame, uh, the interrelations between uh, a writer's different uh, versions of his story or of his representation. The second one is reiterating that point, really, which is saying that um, what we're trying to be able to do is, is almost to see a historical um, sweep, which one might think of, obviously, as a linear process, in fact, as a simultaneous process. Can we compare different stages of the process to bring out and to give emphasis to particularly important aspects of a story. And that's the gamble that I'm going to take now, which is to kind of substantiate these two accounts of what textual criticism might do. Now, I'm doing it now at this stage because some of you might think, God, textual criticism, isn't that kind of something that you do when you're a grown-up? Shouldn't we just be reading the text and thinking about it? In fact, textual criticism seems to me a prerequisite for being able to think about literature at all. For two reasons. First of all, because it is a concentration on the text that is, or that is, as I say, it's a prerequisite for being able to read at all. But to be able to compare two versions of the same text and to elucidate differences involves a particular attention and a particular concentration to the detail of what's written and to so not self-evident, but factual distinctions. The way that one text might use different words. The way that one text might take something out. And so being able to look that closely at the text to see that there's a difference is something that ought to be fundamental to our ability as readers. Then to try to interpret that, to gain a sense of the significance of the difference between the two texts, is something that can then augment our understanding of the story altogether. And I'm going to demonstrate that by looking at two parts of Odo Chrysanthemums, one of which is the way that the children are represented, or not represented, and one of which um, is kind of the major crux in Odo Chrysanthemums, which is the way the end, the ending of the story is constructed. Okay, so then we get a slide that, I'm oh, sorry, there, there's some extra, if you're really interested in textual criticism, have a look at those documents. Okay, so here we have it. These are in the library uh, down at King's Meadow. If, um, if this excites you, and I trust that it is exciting you, um, because what you've got on the right there is D. H. Francis' handwriting, his handwritten uh, interventions. He was making so many corrections to what we call on the chronology the first proofs. He made so many collection, corrections that there are eight extra pages of handwriting that need to be inserted into the original proofs. So what we've got on the left here is what we call the 1910 proofs. Okay? So the original document is this typewritten document sent to him by the publishers. He's received that, and he's just said, oh, no, this isn't what I want. And all of that scribbling out and crossing out is demonstrating the ways in which he's changing the story from his earlier version to what he's perceiving as the version he wants published in 1911. Okay? And as I say, he crosses things out, and then on the right we see that he actually writes things to be inserted into that proof manuscript. Okay? Now, what we've got on the next slide, and I won't turn over um, on the screen yet, simply because that's more pretty than typing. If you turn to the next slide that begins with, she silenced herself and rose to clear the table. Um, so as well, that's going to be on a different, on the, the reverse of uh, the same sheet, isn't it? So, you, um, so you're going to be moving backwards and forwards between these two sheets. Um, the first part of that slide at the top of the page, she silenced herself down to she tore off the grey edge, is what's in the page proofs, the first proofs, they're called the 1910 proofs. The second bit, 
which is three lines long, is in fact what is in Lawrence's emendation or his addition. So he crosses out everything that is there in the main bulk of text at the top of that slide, and he inserts in place of it those three lines which on the board I'm going to point to in a moment are in between those two lines in his handwritten sheet. So this is the first proof. What's underneath, what he's written out or scored out here is at the top of your slide on that page. And this bit that says page 10, those are the three lines that are at the bottom of that slide. Okay? So what he's done is, is cut out really quite a substantial passage. Okay, the passage from she silenced herself to she tore off the grey edge. And place instead those three lines. Okay, what I need us to do, because time is marching on, we do need to read this quite quickly. I'm going to concentrate on this one so we can emphasize the difference that, that this demonstrates, and then we'll look rather more quickly at the ending. So could you read this relatively quickly? I'm going to give you a minute and a half to read the long passage and then the short passage. Read it to your neighbours so I can hear a buzz of happiness and joy. Okay, hopefully you've got through those two passages. I'm going to give you a few more. I'm going to set a couple of tests now. Um, the passage actually comes from page 187 in the Penguin edition. So if you wanted to, to get a bit of context for where this happens, okay, it comes on what's now page 187 in the Penguin. It's also page 187 in the Cambridge edition. Okay? So you'll be able to find in the middle there, while for an hour or more the children played subduedly intent, fertile in invention, united in fear of their mother's wrath and in dread of her father's homecoming, Mrs. Bates sat in her rocking chair making a singlet of thick cream coat of flannel, da 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 da. Which is, as you say, what Lawrence puts in um, as a substitute for that rather long section. Okay, what I want you to do very quickly is to describe with your partner, what are the kind of three things that happen in that long section, okay? What are the things that that's describing, and what function does it serve within the text? Okay, so what's going on in that long passage from the first proof that is removed from the later edition? Okay, what's going on in there? What does this describe? What function does it serve? I'm going to take somebody from that side. <laughs> yes? You're saying that how they overtakes as far as the dramatic irony of that. Dramatic irony, that's very good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we've got this imitation of the father. You've got the son imitating the father, but you've got, and you've got the sense of going down the pit. You've got some technical detail of being down in the pit. You've got the sense of it somehow being almost parodic. In some sense, it's almost comic, but certainly there's a dramatic irony as well because he's emulating the father and it's done within a safe environment and he can come crawling out, but of course his father's not going to come crawling out. So there's a sense in which that kind of exacerbates the, the kind of sense of foreboding maybe in the story. So it's at once kind of ironic, but also quite, quite sinister. Yeah? Um, I just thought the uh, daughter was emulating the mother's behaviour because the show called on the show is Excellent. Yeah, I think that, that, is, that is a good point. So we've got two things there. We've got one about the yeah the child trying to emulate her mother's behaviour, and in that sense it brings us back to this representation of gender, that you've learnt that position already. But there's also this sense of, of trying to ignore and trying to refuse the impending doom as well. So it's kind of, as I say, building up again that sense of, of foreboding. Yeah, at the back? Okay, so we've got, we've got two things going on there. One is that it's kind of saying, well, in fact, the children know what's going on, so the efforts of the mother are, are almost irrelevant. Um, 
And also we've got a sense, yeah, of a, of a kind of a critique of, of expectations about the relations of parents to children and the historical way in which parents might relate to their children. And does this, in fact, alter the way that we might think about, say, Victorian parenting, this seen and not heard stuff? Because what one could say is that this is a documentation from inside a working class family that's demonstrating a different structure of relations and play. Children at play, I mean, where do you get that? Outside of the water babies uh, in 19th century literature. It's something that, that from the inside and from a relation to the adult world is something that, that perhaps isn't there very often. Okay, there was another point back here. In a way, I think all that massive paragraph there, because uh, it's so easily summed up in like those three lines, I think it's better for him to do that because such concentrating on the children like and focusing on them, I think it takes away from the mother's experience a bit because they seem to be used in the in the Penguin version as like a vehicle to show her emotions and like display what's going on, how she tries to protect them and things. And I sort of think that if you focus on them too much, it distracts from that. You've been reading Lawrence's letters, haven't you? I've got though. But that, no. that is, I mean, that seems to me that we've moved on to, the, to what we're saying. Okay, so why does he cut this bit out? Okay, what is it? I mean, it serves all those functions. <coughs> Excuse me. It's got a dramatic irony. It tells us interesting things about the kids. It's actually a bit of light relief. Kids playing, eating a hedgehog. Ho ho. Okay, it's like the comic scene. Um, there are all kinds of things going on there, but Lawrence decides to take them out. Okay, so we worked out what their function is. But to remove them and to distill that into three lines also tells us a lot about the where there is a shift maybe of emphasis and attention to a particular different focus of significance within the story. If you take out the subplot involving the children, if you take out the children playing, what of course you're left with is a much clearer narrative line which focuses on Mrs. Bates, it focuses on Elizabeth, it focuses on Elizabeth's story, and they be, the children become much more peripheral to that story. You take out some of the more kind of sentimental parts of the story, that if you think, well, maybe we're, we're over-egging it a bit to have the poor innocent children set up as a contrast to this, um, to this gloomy future, and, this, it's a, and also the dramatic irony, is that perhaps a little bit heavy-handed? Does it, doesn't it give it away a bit? If I, if I read that, before, because up until the ending, up until when they brought him and he was dead, I thought, is he going to be dead? Is he not going to be dead? Is his leg going to be sawn off? That, like, you did it, I didn't know. But if I read that uh, and saw that the children were playing, I'd draw too much of a comparison between, oh, right. look, how ironic that he's safe and at home. And he's okay, dead so we've got um, a further thing, which is that, yeah, it might actually dissipate some of the sense of, of gloom because it might it might point too directly towards what may ultimately be the outcome. You've got another point on that? I think the next stage that one would do, and we're actually up against time now, so I'm not going to do this within this class, but maybe that's a project for the future, would be to trace in this story the different um, descriptions and representations of the children. And you can see that in the, the published version that you have. If you had available to you the earlier version of the first proofs, which may one day happen, you never know, um, and it is available in, in a journal form in the university. You can start making comparisons about the way the children are represented in those two different texts. And you can start to draw those conclusions about why Lawrence might have changed things in the second text. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some authority to the first text. The first text was, is still a coherent story and does certain things and could conceivably have been published in that form. So you start to see an earlier emphasis and an earlier set of concerns that to some degree are cleaned up or distilled in the later version, but certainly are still present in the later version in a subdued form. So, so it's, it's very true that, that that early version allows us to see a Lawrence that's still working out what's my primary focus in this story, what is it that I really want to talk about, and we can see what he goes on to do, but that doesn't mean 
that all those other things aren't parts of who Lawrence is and what he's trying to do. So we're seeing a development of the writer in those changes, but we're also able to concentrate our sense of what happens in the story that we have in front of us by seeing that these particular lines have been taken out. And if we talk about all the functions that they served and the way that, um, that they've been removed, that allows us to say, okay, within the genre of the short story and within this particular short story, Lawrence is attempting to focus more clearly on Elizabeth. He's attempting not to have heavy-handed dramatic irony. Uh, he's attempting not to have kind of any little comic subplots. And in that sense, he's slimming the story down to give it a particular focus. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so I'll click forward. Um, that's the text we've just seen. Okay, the ending of the text is something that has changed even more radically. Okay, the excision of the children and the way that the children are removed is a very significant change to the text. What you have on your sheet there is the March 1910 proofs, the first proofs version of the ending. As you can see from the screenshot on the right, Lawrence wasn't very pleased with this ending because basically he rubs the whole thing out. Okay? And he rubs it out and then over the next three years there are in fact significant differences again between what he publishes in the English Review and what he finally publishes in the Prussian Officer Collection. And so one of the kind of major tasks of a critic is you can read that final version that you've got in your book in the Prussian officer and you think, oh, that's difficult and that's a long passage and wow, what's he getting at there? To look back at the first book, you'll find that it's almost, uh, it's almost a different story altogether. He's moved away from a lot of the things that he's saying there. If you look at the interim text, okay, which is this one, uh, which doesn't show up very well on the screenshot there uh, on the paper. This is what comes out in the English Review. So we've already corrected from that slide from a couple of months ago. He crosses out that ending and rewrites the ending that's here. This ending is different again in many different ways from the ending that's in your book now. So what you could do would be to compare these three texts and from that to see what is the emphasis that he's trying to achieve in the final? So it stops you having to kind of think, okay, I'm just going to sit here with the ending and see what happens. When you're comparing, it throws into relief the sort of choices that a writer is making, the sort of things that he's adding and the sort of things that he's taking away. And what's particularly significant is that within this middle version, the English Review, this is the only point within the story where we start to get an authorial voice and we start to get personification. It really is something that sounds very much more like a 19th century text. He starts talking about, oh, how poor these people are and what terrible lives they have and how difficult it is, which is a tone that is not there in the later version, where he's allowing things to stand for themselves. Okay, So we've got something that we can look at there in terms, objectively, of a demonstration of a change in style and a change in focus. So I'll take one more question. Sorry? Um, well, this ending is going to be um, um, published on a website uh, at some point soon. And uh, at the moment, it's uh, only available in the original English Review, which you can go and look at in the library. Um, there is a copy in the library. You may have to call up a copy in the Manuscripts and Special Collections. We do own copies of this in university. But the reason why these people are here is that they're going to help me to build a website so that we can compare these different versions of the story. Okay, we're almost out of time. These are, I think, the pertinent questions that arise out of thinking about these different versions of the ending. And this is the questions that you'd be bringing to the comparison of the three or four different versions of Odo Chrysanthemums. And what you'd be doing would be moving beyond that initial reading of the text that you made, those initial responses to the text, to develop a critical reading that draws evidence from the different <laughs> versions which we're very lucky to have available to us. Okay, next week we have a lecture from John McRae and myself, which will take on two further stories in the collection. And the two stories that we're looking at next week are Goose Fair, which I trust you all went to over the weekend.
and the white stocking. So do please make sure that you've got a kiss fair and the white stocking for next week's lecture. Any questions or if you don't have the lecture schedule, come to the front.